things. It, it really bothers me when people say, oh, man, we need to come up with rules that tell the DOD what to do about AI. I mean, they haven't been thinking about these things. They don't understand how important autonomous weapons can be. What are you talking about? The U.S. government's been deploying autonomous weapons like radar-seeking missiles and missiles that can differentiate between targets for decades now. Look at something like a C-RAM or a C-WIZ, the automated guns that are protecting our bases and our ships from incoming mortar fire, incoming artillery fire, incoming missile and rocket fire. Those are autonomous weapons. They're making decisions about what to shoot down and what to not without a person manually deciding what to do beyond deciding to turn on the system and allow it to engage targets, period. That was Palmer Lucky, the founder of Andural, one of the most exciting startups in the U.S. defense sector. Sobering words from him, also quite a bit of perspective. AI is not really new to defense. It's not really new to warfare. It's not really new to weapon systems. And I have a very special guest joining me today to discuss more about not only what the future of AI is, but also to help us understand just how AI has already been playing such an important role. I have with me today on the Over the Horizon podcast, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Lushenko. He's a Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Army. He's a Director of Special Operations and a Faculty Instructor at the U.S. Army War College. He's a Council on Foreign Relations Term Member, Senior Fellow at the Cornell Brooks School for Tech Policy Institute, which he helped establish as the Founding Executive Director. He's also the Co-Editor of Drones and Global Order, Implications of Remote Warfare for International Society. And he's got a book coming out in January next year, which he's co-authored. It's called The Legitimacy of Drone Warfare, Evaluating Public Perceptions. Lieutenant Colonel Paul Lushenko, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you have a very busy schedule, but this is an important subject that we, we're discussing today. It is, and thank you so much for having me here, Rodin. Look forward to the conversation throughout this morning. So your initial response to what we just heard Palmer Lucky talk about there. AI isn't really new. I mean, AI essentially, for the most part of the past few decades, has been an algorithm, heuristic code, which has been at the heart of many weapon systems. So help us understand this entire buzz around AI. Is it really what it's made out to be? Isn't AI the here and now? and has been for a while? Yeah, it's a very important question, a very big question. And if I could redo it all again at Cornell, I'd probably ask that question and attempt to answer it within my doctoral dissertation. I think factually, this is a correct statement that AI is not new, both theoretically, but also in practice. So theoretically, the thought process surrounding the algorithms and their neurology, uh, essentially, that goes into building these systems to approximate human intelligence has been around for centuries, of course, right? And it is true that these systems, at least semi-autonomous systems that can operate to a degree on their own, whether it's flight, whether it's uh, producing targeting options for commanders have been around uh, as well. And, and, and to a degree, there have been fully autonomous weapon systems such as um, was stated to include the CRAM, uh, a, a high powered machine gun that we would have put on our Ford operating bases in both Iraq and Afghanistan where I deploy to autonomously, based upon certain criteria, engage incoming uh, enemy mortar, uh, missile fire, so on and so forth. Now, having said that, I think what we're seeing here is not just a change in kind for the emergence of AI within military circles and war fighting, but real paradigmatic shift in both the scale and scope of artificial intelligence to use for war making. In terms of the former, the scale, what we're seeing is the integration of AI across domain. And because I sit at the Army War College, I may use doctrinal terms that are lost on some. So I'll be very pedantic about explaining just what these terms and this means. And this means simply across air, land, sea, cyber, and space. And this scale, I think, is something different than what we've seen in the past. And the other consideration is the scope of the use, the punitive use, the expected use of AI going forward. No longer is AI going to be integrated at the tactical level of warfare, which is to say battles between friendly and enemy forces. The use of a CRAM, as was just stated, to protect friendly forces in a stationary hardened base. 
But what we're attempting to do is literally scale up the use of AI for consequential matters at both the operational and strategic levels of war. And what that means is that we attempt to adopt artificial intelligence to generate different options that we would execute in terms of a campaign uh, that you synchronize military assets across time and space and force or unit to achieve certain political and military objectives. Because notwithstanding the emergence of AI, warfare ultimately is still about achieving political objectives by other means. And then finally, is the use of artificial intelligence at the strategic level of war, which is to say decision-making for the employment of forces across the globe. So given this notion of scale and scope, yes, AI has been around for literally centuries, theoretically, practically throughout different uh, contests the United States and others have engaged in. But what we're seeing here is something different in terms of the scope of use and the scale of use. In 2021, um, when Israel targeted Hamas in the Gaza Strip, they called it the first AI war. There's been a, a massive leap forward since then, and we're seeing a whole different scenario emerge in this war in Gaza. I want to just play out a, a soundbite by uh, Brigadier General Aviad Dagan, and I hope I haven't murdered, uh, butchered his name. He's uh, This is from March 22 lecture at the Tel Aviv University when he talks about the IDF's new information and AI strategy. Listen to this. Yeah. Data and AI, they have some features that we don't have necessarily in the old ways we were fighting. It's dramatically more flexible and it's dramatically more adaptive of creating any kind of set of data or any kind of an AI network uh, of a neural network than purchasing an F-35 or developing a new weapon for the troops. The speed that we can take this technology and create from it a sort of a weapon is totally different from the old ways we created physical weapons. So that's a really, really sobering thought, wouldn't you say? That there is so much that has happened between 2021 and the current war. And what he's just talked about just gives us a glimpse into the overall picture that is not, as you just rightly pointed out, not just limited to weapon systems or any particular uh, strategy, but it's all encompassing. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I think what he does a really good job of explaining is the intended benefit of AI on the battlefield. And this comes down to the notion which I and others have written about called the sensor to shooter timeline that in the context of the reemergence of great power competition and God forbid conflict between the United States and what the national security strategy recently identified as our pacing threat, China, or even the acute threat, Russia, we would in face of these near peer adversaries have to apply lethal effects at the right time, at the right place for the right purpose faster than they can. And if we can shorten the interval of time between identifying a target, whether it's a structure, whether it's a person, whether it's a network, if we can reduce that interval of time and apply lethal effects or non-lethal effects faster than these near peer adversaries, then the vision is we can achieve our military and political objectives and indeed win in a full on conflict with these states. And so the speed that this general officer talks about is where, in fact, the U.S. military across services, Army, Navy and others are hedging their bets for AI to press down to the tactical level of operations, which means used by privates, by sergeants and by lieutenants. Uh, and the prospects of this are really uh, very um, interesting. Um, but there's a lot baked into these emerging warfighting concepts in terms of the assumptions of trust for our young officers and soldiers to actually operate in concert with these capabilities on the battlefield. You you speak of trust. Um, I think that's a really pertinent uh, issue. And we need to build up trust not only within the, within the military forces using these AI weapons, but also amongst the public around the world. There are a lot of questions being asked about, um, and rightly so, might I add, a lot of concerns about the manner in which um, 
Israel's fire factory, as, as they call it, is um, is targeting um, not only Hamas but all other points of interest uh, in in the Gaza Strip. Um, the question I can't help but ask is, if the dependence on AI systems is so great, are we perhaps giving up too much to the algorithm, too much of the decision-making process to the algorithm? Are we dehumanizing war in a way? That's a very good question and a very complex question. And I'll attempt to unpack that for, for all of us here. Probably won't do it well, but I can draw upon my research empirically uh, for the issue of trust. Trust is complex. Uh, it's multi-dimensional. And my concern as a practitioner within the profession of arms, but also someone who's equipped to study these questions critically through unique techniques, mostly tapping into public attitudes as well as military attitudes, means uh, that we should understand the ingredients that go into trust uh, for these systems tactically. And, and a concern I have is that we have assumed uh, that soldiers uh, and officers, again, across services will trust these systems as if automatically, whereas I'm not really sure that's the case. And so what I do in my research is study two important questions that I think bear directly on the issue at hand. The first is, what do military officers think about the emergence of AI on the battlefield for the anticipated trajectory of warfare going forward? There's a lot of conjecture, almost a lot of hyperbole surrounding AI um, that we actually need to confront and to question. And so what do our officers who's, who are going to be invested with the awesome responsibility of testing, of fielding, of integrating these capabilities within military arsenals, think about AI and future warfare. The other question that I contend with empirically is what actually shapes US, especially US military officers attitude to trust for what we call human machine teaming. That is to say, working in partnership with capability at the battlefield tactical level, all the way up through what we call the sort of National Command Authority, the National Security Council, where decisions on the employment of forces, the escalation in a conflict are being made. What shapes trust in military attitudes for these capabilities? And just briefly, what I find on the former question, which is to say, how do we think warfare is going to evolve? is that officers at the level of about lieutenant colonel to colonel who are training in our premier military institutions in the United States, the Army War College and the Naval War College, are much less distrusting of these capabilities at scale, tactically or strategically, than I think we realize. And part of the reason here, Rodan, is that the conversation about AI is moving so rapidly that we actually haven't stepped back to ask these questions and to rigorously pursue empirical data that gives us some leverage over what officers think. Again, these officers are going to be future generals and admirals, and so their opinions actually matter. And then furthermore, sure. on what shapes trust for partnering with battlefield technologies, which we can unpack here going forward, this is a really complicated picture where I see a tightly calibrated set of circumstances and considerations for the technical specifications of capability, the perceived effectiveness of capability, which gets into especially the, the moral, the perceived moral use of these capabilities. And finally, is the regulatory oversight of capability. And these things, when brought together in combination, can shape trust for partnering with, with, with machines on the battlefield. Yeah. And I'm just going to pull up an article that you, a very insightful article that you just wrote for the bulletin um, about the AI, about AI and the future of warfare. Um, I think it was very timely, very pertinent. Um, and you deal with the issue of trust and, and just what you were, you were talking about. Um, how, can you just give us a bit more insight into, um, and if I could just quote you here where you, you say, to measure the level of trust of the military in lethal autonomous weapon systems, you study the attitudes of officers. What are the parameters that you set for, for, this, for this experiment or for, for your research? And if you can give us some insight into how is it that um, you come to a decision um, whether 
an autonomous system is trustworthy? How do you go about deciding the parameters within which um, you judge its performance and its reliability? Because I guess reliability would be right up there. You well, can't that's trust it. something that you can't rely on. Absolutely. So, so the textbook definition of trust within this context is, in fact, that. And this is based upon years, decades of research for partnership with machines across uh, domains, whether it's industry, whether it's uh, medicine, whether it's uh, socially for social media, driverless vehicles, so on and so forth. But trust is the central what we call dependent variable in this study, which comes down to um, expectations that these machines that are augmented with artificial intelligence will be used over time reliably and as advertised towards shared objectives, whether that it is at the tactical level, so um, destroying some sort of capability, or at the strategic level, generating options for commanders and political leaders, given our civil military relations and history of political control of the military in the United States, will have to make, uh, certainly during crisis escalation. And so how do I study this question? Well, simply, I go to uh, soldiers, uh, service members themselves, the horse's mouth, as we would say, uh, in the United States and probably the broader Western world. So I asked them specifically what their attitudes of trust are. Would they trust partnering with the capability given variation in two important considerations? One is the level, again, the scale at hand, the level at which decisions are being made, whether it's tactically uh, like in a battle or strategically for policy and strategy making. And then the other consideration um, that I tap into is the type of oversight of the AI, whether humans are off the loop or humans are on the loop, which is to say, is it purely machine control, which we know is the notion of killer robots or fully autonomous weapon systems, or do humans still exercise a degree of supervisory oversight? In other words- Let me jump in there. Let me, let me yeah. jump in there a bit because I'm really curious to, to know what you found out, what did you observe in the behavior of officers? Yeah. Um, were they, how, how willing were they to part with, let's say, control over the decision-making process? Yeah, and absolutely. I think it's you. important for us to just kind of clearly explain what I'm varying in this survey experiment. That's what makes our research much more unique than simply a poll or a survey that asks one question and then attempts to extrapolate uh, broad implications. I mean, this is political science, and we can come up with a causal relationship. The other thing, too, Rodin, is that this is first of a kind of research. As a military academic, I have access through our ethical review board to really uniquely rare data for officers, which is coveted because it has implications for modernization and employment of forces. Now, having said that, how do, how do officers respond? Well, as I stated earlier as a preview, Officers are much less distrusting of capability that's augmented with AI than we want to believe. They think, in fact, that it's, that it's dubious. Now, where that becomes a little bit different is this notion of machine control of um, war fighting at the tactical level. And this is the notion of what I call Minotaur warfare. And so I don't know if you have the ability to pull back up that article, but there's a really important graph. Uh, that I present to readers, which is original and, and attempts to stitch together years of research on AI and warfare. And this, again, attempts to understand emerging patterns of AI-enabled warfare. And what I'm talking about here is on the lower right quadrant. Go back up, please. Um, back up, Rodan. Keep going. Right there. The lower right quadrant, which is Minotaur warfare, is tactical decision-making with machine control or oversight. And what I find is that officers, although they still think AI is dubious in this context, are in terms of trust, they don't trust it. They're much more willing to support partnering with these capabilities in the event that they're used at the tactical level. And that's really intriguing to me, right? So on the one hand, they're distrusting of capability augmented with AI as a general matter. But on the other hand, they actually support the use of AI for Minotaur warfare, tactical warfare. And we call this the trust, the trust paradox, not trusting, mm -hmm. but supporting. And I think what this means to me, frankly, is that we have sold ourselves a narrative and for relatively intuitive reasons, the speed, the efficiency, large data, critical thinking that you can approximate in a machine. We have sold ourselves a narrative that future warfare 
is rapidly changing. It's, it's paradigmatically changing. And so I think these officers, while they're uncomfortable trusting AI, are embracing this because that's what our senior leaders are telling us to do. It's codified in warfighting concepts that are emerging in the US Army and Navy, for instance. That's what officers think. They're uncomfortable with it, but they're embracing it because they understand that the sensor to shooter timeline lethality quicker than adversaries is potentially a comparative advantage that we bring, that this capability brings to a fight against China or Russia. So what do you think are the main obstacles in tackling this sort of an attitude and, and how do you go about building trust? I guess that really is the question. It is. And so great question. So the, the research and policy and then military modernization implications of this research agenda are, are quite um, consequential. And so I'll just unpack it briefly through those three considerations. The first is we, we need to admit that trust is not a foregone conclusion, that it's not guaranteed. Trust for me is almost like personal integrity that's so very important for leadership in the U.S. Army. It's hard to, uh, to gain, but very easy to lose. And it's based upon reputation over time and when you can match word and deed, okay? And so I think we have to admit that trust is not a foregone conclusion. Now, having said that, we need much more research about the mechanisms or variables that shape trust. So in my study, it's an initial stab. It should be built upon. We should take a look at trust in the context of different types of warfare. I only talked about large scale ground combat operations, the so-called great power uh, war, but we should talk about a regular warfare. We should talk about nuclear command and control. Uh, by that token, we should uh, focus researching the implications of the employment of different weapons systems, right? The implications of different operating environments, because again, this is just based upon attitudes and intuitions. It's not like what's happening in the Air Force where US Air Force researchers through the Loyal Wingman program are taking a look at the physiological indicators, the sweat or perspiration, the eye flickering uh, that a, a, a pilot actually incurs when partnering with a fully autonomous capability. In terms of a policy, I think we have to be really clear about how we are developing these capabilities and how they're going to be employed. Because in my research, what I find is that officers uh, at this level, again, future generals and admirals, whereas they do appreciate domestic oversight, are really interested more so in the way that the use of these systems align with international law and the standards of conduct or norms. And this is hard, right. real quick, this is hard because we are, we are building norms in flight. The way that we use the capability right now is actually codifying standards of use uh, in the United States, which will potentially be replicated abroad. So we better be careful for what we ask for. And then finally, for military modernization, I think what we have to do is take this research seriously and understand that there's a body of findings for what shapes trust. And if we want soldiers to trust this capability, we ought to build capability like that in the first place and then test it over time and integrate it at different formations to, to really optimize it. You know, I can't help but wonder who is accountable when something goes wrong? Is it the algorithm? Is it the company that developed that algorithm? Is it the officer who took the final call? Is it is it the um, the intelligence based on which uh, the algorithm reached a, or offered up a, a particular, um, let's say a firing solution or the options? Who is accountable when things go wrong? That's another tough question with years of cognitive science research that we need to tap into to figure this out. I mean, the, the problem is this, we don't really know. As you take a look at the, and I'm being completely honest. Um, when I appreciate you take that. Look, yeah. Yeah, when we take a look at the research here, right? There are people that argue that there is a so-called accountability gap. So my colleague at the University of Melbourne, a guy by the name of Robert Sparrow, who's very prolific in this space from a sort of moral ethical perspective, I was just talking the other day, at a conference virtually, uh, that is, we'll talk about an accountability gap. In other words, the system is used autonomously. Who's accountable when there are, God forbid, civilian casualties or collateral damage? That's an outstanding question. And it's too easy, potentially, or so the theory goes, for officers who are ostensibly in charge of these capabilities to outsource responsibility because it's in a fully autonomous mode. This, this is what the line of argument is. On the other hand, there are those that say, well, no, we could have distributed responsibility 
which taken, takes in consideration everything, Rhoda, that you have talked about, from the software producers to the hardware producers to the industry leaders who are peddling us around um, whatever avenue in Washington and the Pentagon, to the soldiers that are using it, to the officers that are using it. The, the devil's in the detail, of course, but the, the notion is you could build policies and regulations within the military, especially that would pin the rows for responsibility in the event of unintended consequences like civilian casualties. I'm not sure if that's the case because what we're seeing unfolding right now is a significant yeah. lag in terms of development based upon the hype and yeah. hyperbolic rhetoric surrounding these capabilities, right? Yeah. And then the regulatory oversight, not just domestically, but globally. I mean, yeah. the Convention on Certain Weapons at the UN has been around for almost two decades, if not longer, and we still don't have a codified definition of what fully autonomous weapon system is, not least to mention policies which should govern their use. This is a wicked yeah. problem. It is. It is. And it's not going to go away, I, I suspect, um, just as in other technologies, whether it was um, seat belts for cars or whether it was aviation and the FAA for formulating new rules and regulations, and then those rules and regulations spreading out across the world and being adopted by other aviation authorities. Yeah. It seems that the lawmakers are always trying to catch up with new technology. And the scary bit is this technology is so drastically different and advanced, and the implications are so, so severe that I wonder if we can afford ourselves the luxury of having our lawmakers play catch up with the technology, especially when you consider the the race for the latest AI between, let's say, the United States and China. Yeah. So what I find in my research is that even given sort of the scale of decision making and the, and the type of oversight, one thing that will compel more trust among officers who, again, are going to be invested with the awesome responsibility to integrate this over time is this notion of an AI arms race, that we would be put at a disadvantage if others to include identified adversaries, China and Russia, were to adopt the capability. But at the same time, and this is quite heartening, that more education leads to more specialized and broader knowledge that begs a lot of questions that can actually reduce trust. Here's two things I just want to mention uh, real briefly. Notwithstanding that this is a wicked problem for responsibility, I've come to the place where I actually agree with large business CEOs who are thinking about AI in the workplace to take a pause or moratorium on development, to work through the, the logic, the reasoning for these very important moral and ethical considerations. Now, there are some, like my colleague at the US National Defense University, TX Hams, who's a really well-known futurist, and I respect him very much, but he, he has made this, this line of argument that we ought not to consider the moral implications of autonomous weapon systems, because what matters on the battlefield is putting warheads on foreheads and achieving the mission, right? What I find in my research, and I think this is very important to consider, is that the most important factor that shapes officers' trust in AI, tactically, that is, is a reduction of civilian casualties and increase in force protection. And these are two competing, potentially competing, logics, moral logics. And so at the same time that we say that warfare is post-heroic, it's nothing more than PlayStation or video games, what I see is quite the opposite among senior leaders in training, that they actually are really attuned to the potential unintended consequences and will do everything in their power to buy down risk to civilians while uh, you know, attempting to achieve the objective and to protect our own forces. And, and that's a really key finding because morality in fact, is the most important shaping uh, factor for uh, attitudes of trust among officers. That's true indeed. It's, it's very true. All right, let's, let's um, look at a few case studies, shall we? And let's, let's start with another soundbite from um, Brigadier General Aviad Dagan. We can change the way we fight. For instance, we can speak about um, power decision support systems that although an officer at the end of the process, we take the decision, the computer or the machine will provide him the suggestion that he never could do it alone. Never. I will show you an example shortly. We can speak about AR-based um, awareness, uh, a situational awareness of the troops. We can change even 
the processes that we, we have, we can in, uh, um, and team man and machine. So a lot of the processes that he was talking about, um, the raw material is intelligence, ISR. And a lot of ISR is Earth observation. And we've seen Palantir do some very, very interesting stuff. Just one of the companies, Palantir, Edge through its Edge AI, which it launched on, I think it was a Satellogic satellite, um, I think in March or April last year which really crunched down the time that it took um, to process images through Earth observation and then pass them on through analysis. How transformative to the process of intelligence gathering and analysis and then decision making is AI, especially when it's in situ in the satellites that are used for Earth observation? I, I mean, I think it's potentially paradigmatically important. I mean, almost revolution, uh, a revolution in military affairs, I would, I would have to say. Because again, what you're doing is you're allowing the AI to crunch numbers or data, as the general officer has stated, to produce in this case as per a decision support system at the strategic level with machine oversight. So what I call mosaic or hyper warfare. Um, decisions to be made by commanders at a speed um, and a scale that we haven't necessarily experienced, haven't experienced before. That's quite, um, that's quite revolutionary. Um, I also think there's a consideration here for the generational gap uh, that we may find in our empirical research between so-called digital natives, uh, which are junior officers at the lieutenant level, um, in respective services, or in fact, those who are training to become officers, either at our service academies uh, like West Point, and then at, at the senior level, All right? So there's an assumption that these junior officers and pre-commissioned cadets will actually trust the systems more. And what I find in my research is that one, there is a true generational gap. There can be more trust among sort of junior leaders and cadets but this generational gap isn't necessarily for reasons that scholars typically think about. It's not misplaced optimism, for instance. What I find is quite the opposite, that they're a little bit more um, scrutinizing of the capability used for non-lethal purposes. So like the general had stated, generation of different options. And then furthermore, quite fascinating, is that junior um, cadets in training are, are willing to assume more risk for false positive rates, which means target misidentification if the capability will achieve uh, the mission, it contributes highly uh, to the mission. And so the implications here, given what the general said, deal with training, deal with doctrine, fielding uh, and experimentation, and of course, use over time. Let me pull up a video from uh, Palantir and play it out because this is really, really groundbreaking. This is something you, you were talking about. Um, this is Palantir's SkyKit, Intelligence and Operations at the Edge which employs Edge AI. Yep. Introducing Palantir SkyKit. Bringing intelligence and operations to the edge. SkyKit is built for disconnected, adverse, hostile, and extreme environments. It is a self-contained intelligence center, giving soldiers an advantage over adversaries. All right, before this turns into a promo and an ad, a free ad for Palantir. <laughs> That's right. Essentially, so this is technology that I'm not sure if very many people are aware of, that it exists. Um, it's scary to give that much power to the infantrymen, to give that much power to the soldier on the ground. Um, you can't help but wonder where this is headed next. But let's begin by dissecting this, um, this new found power a bit and help us understand what this does in terms of providing a force multiplier. Yes, it's a, a, another great question. And so, for me, it seems that the force multiplying effect of this capability to the degree that we think there is one, and I think there is, 
is that in the context of, again, large scale ground combat operations, which is the doctrinal term we use in the military to explain state on state, country on country conflict, what's really important is gaining situational awareness more rapidly than your adversary, especially considering the fact that with the emergence of these technologies, the footprint or the ability to observe a formation may in fact be much more reduced uh, than it was in earlier uh, conflict periods, right? And so if that's the case, you could potentially tap into this capability via the drone that comes apparently incorporated within this box to gain awareness of your adversary's movement, which then is incorporated this data into a broader database of different data points that are potentially captured across the battlefield through distributed sensors to rapidly build an understanding of what we call the enemy sit temp or situational template, where they may be based upon what their doctrine says they should be doing in a certain terrain, uh, pursuant to a certain mission. In, in that case, I think there is a force multiplying effect to increase your awareness, which again, drives the application of non-lethal and lethal fires, which ultimately is what you're looking for with these capabilities to reduce the sensor to shooter timeline. When we talk about the material solution at hand, this box plus the drone, I, I have a lot of questions is sort of a previous in the field intelligence officers officer who would have um, enabled uh, maneuver. And, and that is, you know, how durable and ruggedized is the capability to include the drone? Is the drone what we call a pacing item? Is it the Achilles heel? If the drone goes gone, do we not have the ability to extend our operational reach to build that situational awareness I'm talking about? Those are the sort of material uh, implications I'm thinking about going through uh, this advertisement as you, as you stated. The other thing that I kept coming back to was and I think this is to the heart of the matter of your question, is the implications for responsibility versus authority. So, so soldiers at the tactical level may have the responsibility to close with and destroy the enemy. And this is the purpose um, of, of the military, of the army, uh, to be blunt about it. But in an era of AI depressed to the tactical level, which our situational awareness is expanded, we have fully autonomous weapon systems, do they, should they have the authority to apply effects like a commander would in a bygone era, even during GWAT, which is the global war on terrorism. This notion of calibrating authorities to responsibility, much like the responsibility gap we talked about, is another sort of uh, problem that I don't think we fought through as, as much as we should as we build a capability, as we incorporate it across our military arsenals. I can't help but come back to it again and, and keep wondering whether we're, we're leaping before we're really testing the ground where we land. And it seems to be that we're learning as we go and we're adjusting on the fly. And that's not, it's not an optimal scenario. Well, it's not. It, it, this is where I'm at as well. Uh, as someone who studies these matters deeply in an empirical sense, I think we have put the proverbial uh, cart before the horse, which is why, why military academics like myself, um, who are in the profession of arms, but also have sort of a moral obligation um, to, to identify blind spots, uh, to identify red flags, uh, are so intent on raising these issues to senior levels. Um, we may believe that this is the way the warfare is going, but we haven't put the mechanisms at place in various ways as we've talked about to adopt this um, smartly. The other thing that really concerns me as a student of military innovation is that we often don't talk about the pernicious underbelly of innovation, which is to say it can go wrong. I have a colleague at the Naval War College who is uh, published on this, who's got a theory of perverse military innovation where there's a resourcing gap. Uh, there's a gap between resources and what you want to achieve. There's a sense of manufactured urgency, which is where I think we're at right now, that leads to a headlong development of capability uh, without concept, without doctrine, uh, without testing and fielding that results in precisely the vulnerabilities that you want to reduce because of a lack of user trust, which is why trust is so important to get right in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm not sure if we can trust companies like Palantir or Andural or the big five defense manufacturers to ensure that we read the fine print uh, and to have transparency in their caveats and to say, look, I mean, 
this is cutting edge, bleeding edge technology handled with care. Because yeah, so I'll, I'll handle any, this any defense, man yeah, any defense mean, I'll, manufacturer, yeah, any manufacturer would want to sell as much as they can, right? Yeah, and, so and the pitch is the pitch is hardcore. And yeah. This is going to transform your strategy. This is going to transform your abilities on the ground. So I'm going to handle this one with care because I'm not really in a position to talk about the incentives or the politics of the contracting business. But what I will tell you is that this capability, these set of capabilities, is only as good as the data. Right. So we often conflate machine learning with AI. I believe one is incorporated in the next, uh, especially in terms of generative AI or narrow AI, which is which this is an example of. It's designed for a certain purpose to expand our situational awareness as a combat multiplier, but it's only as good as the data. So if you back up about 10 years when I was the senior intelligence officer for our Joint Special Operations Task Force in Afghanistan, I actually was involved in the beta testing for Project Maven which is now under a different um, term or moniker, but still has the same purpose of attempting to identify rapidly through machine learning and big data, hostile act and hostile intent to generate targeting solutions for a commander. Again, very rapidly, it wasn't fully autonomous, but it would generate targeting solutions very rapidly. Is someone doing something bad or do we think they will? Should we apply an effect? And at that time, they lacked data. Google lacked data. Right. And so the question I have, again, as a practitioner of the profession of arms who's talking about these issues is, is where is the data coming from? Are we testing it? Are we incorporating it in you know, our, 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 our divisions, uh, which are large scale war fighting organizations for the U.S. Army? I mean, how can we be so sure that this capability is going to operate in the way that it's intended or marketed to operate? Again, the devil's in the details. And so as far as I can comment on the contractual purposes or the contractual issues at hand, it's the data that we need to go into building these systems to give reasonable assurance that they're going to operate as uh, as advertised, literally. Okay, so let's let's turn our attention a bit to to the Air Force and how AI and modern technology is transforming. I would imagine almost every aspect of the Air Force, right from the pilot's helmet to the capabilities of the aircraft to let's say add on and extended capabilities with the new with the sixth generation NGAT um, platform and the loyal wingman platform let's let's begin by talking a bit about the helmet systems so we talk about sit situational awareness for pilots in these advanced aircraft and the workload that they have to shoulder and when you have ai and graf graphical interfaces that just transform the amount of data that is uh, fed to the pilot in real time and just simplify uh, the decision-making process. As a country that does not have access to this technology, can you even hope to compete? Well, this is the real hedging of bets for this push for AI is that we want to outcompete as per this AI arms race that we've built up. I'm not really sure if we're there, frankly. We can talk about that. Uh, before our adversaries get get a hold of this capability. So, you know, truth in lending, I'm, I'm a U.S. Army Airborne Ranger. I am not a pilot uh, in the Air Force uh, or um, in the Navy. I'm not sure I'd ever want to be one. My twin brother, identical, uh, that is, is in fact a pilot for uh, the U.S. Navy. He flies uh, the other platform, which is a helicopter. And what I can tell you with my conversations um, with pilots across our uh, services uh, in the air domain, the Navy in, in the Air Force, is that this is really, again, revolutionary and paradigmatic for you know a couple of reasons. For the pilot, uh, him or herself, it, it reduces a lot of risk um, that you would have instantaneous access to not just targetable data that was presented on the, the, the heads up display there, uh, but also the health of the aircraft, right? Because there's a series of emergency procedures as I take it uh, in long conversations with, with my brother that a pilot will go through to prevent a stall, to reverse a stall, to ensure that if there's an engine out, they can still safely fly uh, to home base or whatever sort of landing area. So that's really key is, is the risk at play. Again, notwithstanding that the, the testing development incurs a lot of risk for these test pilots. Probably the best way to understand the implications of this in, in a military context is through what we call our operational uh, factors time, space, and force, okay? So when we, when we think about operations across echelon, tactical, operational, strategic, we think about time, space, and force as a way to synchronize different capability to achieve an effect. 
And so by that way, what we're seeing right now is a drastic reduction in time, a collapsing of time in identifying a potential target and then the ability to apply an effect. But not just that, a reduction in time to communicate cross domain with friendly forces that they talked about being able to communicate with land-based forces, for instance, as well as our allies and partners. So that's time, that, that's pretty significant. The other thing too is space. We are also collapsing space as well, because now it's not just that we're over the horizon with these capabilities, a drone or a jet in this case, but we have extension of radar. So we're at range of the actual sensor, which again is collapsing uh, the enemy space and expanding ours. That's quite a comparative advantage in uh, the context of large scale war. And the final thing is this notion of unit or force that when you think about modern day warfare, we have we have the tendency to reify or reduce conflict to, to a capability. You know, drone warfare is often understood as simply the platform, this notion of drone essentialism. The reality is really kind, kind of contrary that modern warfare is about combined arms maneuver. We are synchronizing across joint forces capabilities to impose multiple dilemmas against an adversary so we can get a window of opportunity to employ systems that penetrates, I don't know, an anti-access aerial denial sort of system, right? If that's the case, if we are expanding our time, expanding our space, reducing the adversaries, working cross-domain, we have in fact achieved cross-domain combined arms maneuver, joint combined arms maneuver. All three of these things combined, at least theoretically, because we actually haven't tested this, nor we want to, I believe, in large war with a great power, all of these things provide advantages or force multipliers. That's why this capability is so paradigmatic. All right, let's let's shift focus to, to the Navy and applications of artificial intelligence, autonomy. So this is supposed to be a submarine hunter that goes yeah. out, you know, uh, covers vast uh, stretches of the sea, uh, of the ocean, wherever you want, whether it's the Pacific or the Atlantic, and does its thing on its own with very little supervision. It's able to think for itself, Mm -hmm. It's capable of tracking down uh, uh, vessels of interest and even acting upon, hopefully, um, a decision that is taken by a human and that there is enough time for a human to evaluate the options before that decision is taken. But the very fact that you have these capabilities existing today is mind-blowing. I, I mean... Sure, it, it absolutely does, right? It's akin to what we get at other um, services. So I must profess as an Army person, I, I went to the Naval War College and I, I know a little bit about the Navy in terms of this is a uh, SUW, anti-surface, uh, subsurface sort of warfare, uh, sub-hunters, you called it. So as I step back and I take a look conceptually at the where the, where the Navy is at in terms of its development of UA, um, unmanned aerial, uh, unmanned sea vessels rather, um, I, I think the problem with the Navy is, it, it got, like the Army, it's, it's got a lot of great material solutions um, going forward. But what I don't see in either doctrine or concepts for the Navy is a way to integrate this stuff across time and space. In other words, there's no operational concept or methodology that would drive the employment of this system, except to say that go conduct the task of ASUW, anti-subsurface uh, warfare, through mines or, or whatever. And so in a forthcoming piece with a colleague of mine who's much smarter on these ma matters, a, a commander, Michael Posey, uh, who, who flies a sort of electronic warfare uh, platform in the Navy, we sketch out a way to think about the employment of these systems uh, that deal with um, sort of picket, that they would be stationary at consequential sea lanes of communication uh, and even straits like the Strait of Malacca, the South China Sea, whatever, to provide situational awareness as a force multiplier, as we talked about but potentially some limited capability for counter uh, fire, whether it's non-lethal or lethal. As you ratchet that up a little bit is the ability to distribute these capabilities across different bodies of water with the intent and purpose to come together finally at a particular time and place, this notion of what we call as the third method, mass, that you would overwhelm after some deception, after some producing of, of vulnerabilities for the enemy, uh, you would mass at a certain time and place um, for a, a particular purpose. 
Now, if we agree that these are potentially useful ways of thinking about employment of systems, picket, distributed in mass, one way that you can optimize this, because our adversaries, of course, US adversaries are thinking in these ways as well, potentially, is to capitalize on human machine teaming within the maritime domain. And so you can take all this stuff and you can bring it together in sort of a joint maritime combined arms maneuver sort of way. And what I don't see, similar to the Army, is research for that. I'm not going to say it doesn't exist. Uh, DARPA, as you mentioned, is uh, leading the way in this for, for the military. So chances are it does. But we haven't explained this as broadly as I think we need to, to increase, again, user trust in these capabilities. This stuff is being actively tested, by the way, in the CENTCOM AOR, as you know. Uh, yeah, Central yeah. Command AOR. yeah. You spoke of, uh, you, you mentioned Thucydides. Uh, I can spit out the word right. <laughs> <laughs> there's a Thucydides um, trap, and there's a book written about it, uh, very enlightening. It talks about how the US and China are locked uh, in an inev inevitable um, trajectory where they will face off with each other. Um, there's a lot of talk about that happening sooner and later. And I want to go back to uh, Palmer Lucky and play this soundbite from him where he talks about this very scenario. How much those conversations surrounding Taiwan, the concerns there are building and whether or not it's actually something that you that you are having conversations with the DOD about? I mean, it's all about that. Everyone is talking about making sure that the capabilities that we're building today are ready to go for a fight in the Pacific in 2021 or earlier, because that is the latest that we see China trying to launch an offensive for a variety of reasons. That's the timing for some kind of action against Taiwan, which is critical to our economy. Uh, you know, there's a lot of places around the world that we call partners. There's a lot of places around the world that we say are important to our interests. Taiwan and their semiconductor industry is really about as important as it gets, especially for such a small country so close to China. The good news is I think people are recognizing this threat. Big tech companies years ago thought that China was someone that was going to be a huge growth market for them. They thought they were going to get in and sell them social media, sell them services. And I think people are starting to realize that that's not what's happening. They're coming here and they're eating our lunch. And that is, I think, positive for tech companies' decision to start working with the DOD again. Let's talk about the Thucydides trap and the US and China. You just had the AI conference in the UK where a bunch of countries signed up and agreed not to um, push forward at, at, the, at, at, a, at an exponential rate with the implementation of AI in weaponry, in weapon systems. It's all, it's all well and good to talk about it. But in reality, when you're talking about strategic interests and national interests, and when you're talking about a scenario where the US might have to step in and defend Taiwan, what, what sort of a future scenario do you see playing out given the rapid developments in AI in a face-off in the Pacific? That's a very good question. I think the higher order question and what this becomes symptomatic of is just this evolving security dilemma that the Chinese and the Americans at the sort of strategic leader level have based upon mutual enmity, misunderstanding, and suspicion. That is more problematic. And again, AI becomes a symptom of this and in integration across domain and at scale, as we talked about, to again, reduce the sensor to shooter timeline, to apply lethal effects quicker than our adversaries. This is the golden key, the, the, the key ingredient to success in future warfare, or so we think. You know, I respect Palmer Lucky, having never met him. Seems like in Costa Mesa, California, he's positioned uh, with all the right people to drive innovation forward. Uh, but I do question a lot of the assumptions, uh, and they are assumptions about the inevitability of war between China and the United States. If you take a look at Graham Allison's book, and I know this because I was berated by an editor, he actually doesn't talk about the Thucydides trap in terms of inedible conflict between the United States and China. What he talks about is a setting of conditions akin to Sparta and Athens, where fear, honor, and interest led to the inevitability of conflict. And this is a toast and a warning that we ought to think a little bit more smartly about diplomacy, um, intermural cooperation, where it matters for non-traditional security threats and challenges within but the region. But it does seem about, it does, it does seem given what we're seeing in the world around us, does seem that there is a lot, uh, there is a lot of fire, and not just smoke. P potentially, that, right? So, so, so with that, having said that, 
let me just walk you through what we tell our students here, right? Operationally, tactically, operationally, and strategically. So strategically, although I'm not necessarily a, a liberal institutionalist in terms of theory, right? I do believe that the evolving Sino-US relationship has got to such a point where there is extreme interdependence, right? By way of globalization, heightened interdependence, interconnectivity, so on and so forth, that reduces or dampens uh, the tosins of war. And this is an empirical question, right? Uh, but nevertheless, China needs the United States and the global market capital uh, system as much uh, as the United States does, right? And this is the notion that John Eikenberry talks about is it's too big to fail, right? At the operational level, it is true that there's competing security order building approaches within the region, right? So the United States has our hubs and spoke systems. It's, it's guaranteed security for the better part of 75 years. Whereas the Chinese want to go back to the future in terms of the Sinocentric order and stuck in the middle are key allies and partners like Australia, like Japan, like South Korea and other smaller powers across Southeast Asia that are attempting to thread the needle between an economic partner in China within the region and a security guarantor conventionally and in terms of nuclear weapons. We have to figure out how to reconcile these two approaches. And one way to do that is to recognize that each country has status, has a reputation at play here, and potentially come up with some sort of tacit division of labor between the United States and China for security threats and challenges. This is not a Gordian knot. That's what I'm trying to say. We can resolve these issues at the leader level. And then finally, a war over Taiwan, much less a war anywhere else in Asia, is good for nobody. I mean, I just walked through about 20 congressional officials from the U.S. Congress in a war game that I built with a colleague. And we talked through a potential conflict over the Sukaku and Dayu Islands, depending on your Japanese or Chinese, in the East China Sea. And what I found, and this is published and people can read it, is fundamentally nobody wants war because there's a recognition of monumental cost to not just the global right. economy, but to our countries that we would have yeah. to weather for potentially a generation. And so fundamentally, I question this notion of sort of a immutable march towards war. And that probably is not a popular opinion within the military, because we're often looking for the other as a way uh, to identify doctrine, to uh, yes. justify resources. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really concerned that as Palmer Lucky had talked about 2027 is being touted as you know the the line of demarcation or what we call the right. the, the line of departure the ld uh for yeah. war with china yeah but if you if you if you look at the onshoring of uh, business processes um a reversal of the past few decades if you look at the chips act if you look at the ira if you look at what america is trying to do to reduce its dependency on the chinese market when it comes to critical mineral supply chains uh, building independence, you can't help but wonder, step back and wonder if this is, if someone up there knows something is coming down the road and America is preparing for the inevitable face-off in the Pacific. Yeah, so this is this is signaling um, and this is audience cost, right? Two foundational concepts within security study scholarship, which means that, you know, we're doing so much that we're just compelling ourselves to follow through, right? This is sort of the, the high tying hands uh, notion of audience cost. I, I think what's going on right now um, is what we call taken sort of a bow from the quiver of Thucydides, sort of a parabellum approach to our security, which is to say the best defense is the best offense. There's certainly a, a hedging of bets taking place um, within the region and globally for both countries, which is why I agree with my former professor from Cornell University, Jessica Chen Weiss, who writes broadly and prolifically on these matters that at the leader level, we have to see eye to eye given the potential cost of conflict. The other thing really interesting about reshoring the CHIPS apps and so forth, and I've taken a look at this with colleagues at Cornell University, is that public opinion here actually matters for uh, US officials. And so if we are in a representative democracy where democratic oversight and accountability matters, in other words, public opinion matters, and from a domestic political uh, consideration, the CHIPS Act really panders to a base that wants to reshore this market to the United States for, let's say, job uh, uh, production. 
But I do believe that the real opportunity cost here is to capitalize on the chief benefits of globalization, which is absolute gains that we can gain as a region, as a global community of states uh, by outsourcing, by capitalizing on uh, people's comparative advantages. I like that you're such an optimist. Well, I mean, what's the what's the quote of the notion that, you know, the people who don't pray for war the most are those who actually wield it, who, who participate in it. And, you know, that's that's soldiers. Right. I mean, I, yeah. I have nobody special, but for the last 20 years, I've deployed consistently on behalf of my nation. You mentioned interest. These, these are vital national security interests where we would you know, willingly sacrifice our lives or die for it. I've done that. I've missed birthdays. I've missed anniversaries. I've missed graduations um, and so on and so forth. And again, a lot more people other than me have done that as well. And so when you talk about optimism, it's all that stuff, right? As well as a way of life that that I consider, uh, which is intangible, but still very important. So we better be damn sure about escalation. And if these are really vital national security interests before we go the route of a war over Taiwan. The other question too is, are the Taiwanese willing to sacrifice and shed blood over their own country, right? Um, there is there is research and there is commentary that that you know the extent of nuclear deterrence through a sort of a tacit security arrangement or treaty means a lot for the Taiwanese and it, and it should. Um, do, do, do do United States mothers and daughters want to want to shed blood over Taiwan is a really really important question. Um, well, you've given me a lot to think about, a lot to think about, and I likewise. I've, <laughs> and and your optimism has rubbed off to an extent but i can't help but be a skeptic um the skeptic in me is is too overpowering i hope that um ai is more of a deterrent um than an effector of of death and violence and destruction Rhoda, one thing i would say um is to close out one thing that does worry me is potentially the willingness for soldiers especially in the context of, of large scale ground combat operations, combat operations, where we're talking about tactical nu nuclear weapons, uh, is, is, is soldiers propensity to outsource oversight by way of machines on, on these systems. Um, I'm putting together a, a survey experiment um, for uh, an outlet that I'm going to publish in that talks about this question of to what degree are officers at the senior level willing to listen to a machine in, in terms of generation op, generating options or applying effects through tactical nuclear weapons? And this is apocalyptic. I mean, it sounds so outlandish to even bring this up. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, given a renewal of great power competition, we've pivoted clearly to the prospects for a war with, with uh, near peer adversaries. In that context, what we're talking about here at our war colleges is resiliency in a nuclearized environment. Like at what point can you go into an area that has been targeted by a tactical nuclear weapon based upon the dispersal of nuclear material? I, this is back to the future stuff. I just heard Frank McKenzie, general retired CENTCOM commander at University of Tampa. I was at a conference giving a, a, a keynote on some of these issues. And he said that what we need to be thinking about in the military now is what he was thinking about three decades ago as a young Marine Corps platoon leader, which is survivability in a nuclear denied environment. That's what really scares me. And there's actually some research by way of my colleagues at Stanford, Jacqueline Schneider and others that talk about the willingness of security professionals that are war colleges. This is all sort of descriptive now to um, to, so to press or to pre-delegate nuclear command and control based upon algorithms. Algorithms. We, we need to study that a little bit more, and that's what kind of keeps me up uh, at night. Yeah. Thank you for scaring me more. <laughs> <laughs> it's been such a pleasure talking to you. I began by introducing you as Lieutenant Colonel. I think the doctor hat suits you better. <laughs> You've given us so much to think about, so much to chew on, so much insight. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight. And I really hope we can have you back on the Over the Horizon podcast again in the future. Thanks, Rod. I really appreciate the time today.